Good morning and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 205. Today, we're going to talk about how to close out the game. What is the mindset for that? Changing your personality. Is it even possible? And uh, something about badminton, I think. Oh, 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 no. How to practice mindfulness with your friends. Very different from doing it by yourself when you're in-game. Welcome to the Ask Weldon Show. My name is Weldon, and this is my show where you ask me questions. I'm a sports psychology trainer, and I have a master's degree in sports sciences. And uh, so I typically take questions related to esports psychology, sports psychology, training, training optimization. I'm a League of Legends coach, and so that is kind of my wheelhouse. However, uh, I try to answer questions related to mindset, specifically across all esports titles. And my goal, of, as always, is to figure out how it is that we can use developmental esport in order to make ourselves better both in the game and outside of the game in life. The questions that I have on the show range between, uh, you know, like I said, performance and peak performance to relationships to how it is to take what we do in the game and bring it elsewhere. Um, Constantly improving yourself is the goal. If you have a question for the show, please call it into anchor.fm slash Weldon Green, anchor.fm slash Weldon Green. There's a little plus audio button on that app, and you can just call in the question. You'll hear them later on the show today. It's a really cool app. It makes you sound like you have a radio voice kind of personality. They have this sort of algorithm that that makes your voice sound cool instead of like you're calling through a phone. So you should check it out and make sure to call in your question, even if you think you already know the answer, because the point is to help the other people who are going to hear the answer with your context specifically attached to it and give them the insight into their lives. It's not only for your own ego and self-satisfaction. So if you're hesitant about calling in because A, you're like, who am I to take up the time? I don't care. And B, um, I already know the answer and it's just I'm not doing it so it doesn't matter. Both of those things are wrong. We need the context of as many different individuals as we can with even if it's the same question in a different way. Uh, I get the same question all the time. Okay, trust me, I've been doing this for four years. I get the same questions every single day, but the way that they are asked is always different. And as some of the best ways that they've been asked have come through, you know, is since I've switched to audio questions and I love it. So continue to put your hat in the ring and submit your ticket to see if you win the best way that this question has ever been asked award on the show. All right, why don't we go ahead and jump into the first set of questions? All right, like I said, this first question comes from Lars, and it's related to mindset with friends. Um, It's Lars again, and I completed your Mac program recently, and I really liked it. It was uh, great fun, and I learned a lot about myself. And I was wondering if you have any advice on how to practice mindfulness during games if you're playing with your friends or playing duo queue or whatever. Because uh, it's really difficult for me to do it, and um, your pro teams had to do it, and they were sitting on TeamSpeak, at least I hope they did, so maybe you have some advice on how to do that. Thanks very much. All right, so first of all, thanks for the question, and um, thanks for the plug for the Mac program, by the way. If you guys want to check that out, on games.gg slash MAC, I'll talk about it later in the program. The... Goal with practicing mindfulness with friends is very similar to practicing it in-game. The mechanism is the same as well. The difference is it feels like instead of being in a library, you're out on a sports field, right? So up until this point in the Mac program, you do your mindfulness like you're in a library where, you know, you try to like set aside distractions and get everything and you're sitting in a chair and you're maybe all alone, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not how the real world is. That's not how the rugged world is. And your friends are going to be presenting you with a bunch of training opportunities. So what I'd like you to do is think of starting at the beginning again with the centering exercise. You want to have these three very powerful breaths that you can use to center yourself within your emotional state and to start observing the flow of emotions through your body so that you can react according to your wishes instead of according to your emotions. First step there is awareness, right? As always, awareness. So you want to be able to pull out that awareness in the moment with your friends, and that is going to come through essentially having it as swift as possible that you're able to center yourself. So really what you're going to be starting with and focusing on is this centering exercise and the, and doing it all the time. So what you should you look for when you're doing it? Well, 
any single time that you have a frustration or something with an emotion with it with a friend or you have a learning moment that you have the opportunity to step up into but you're afraid to say something so for example i think i did a lot of mindfulness training with the guys when i said when i forced them to share their flaws in the game and i said okay this is the moment when you have to step up and say where you messed up and i want you to take a few like you know three deep breaths and center yourself and like master your emotions and I don't care about your shame or your guilt. Like these things are part of it and you should experience that as well, but like just share. And then we would go on in a circle, right? So everybody would have to do it. So if you see these moments of grand leadership where you can confess something first to be the first person to come out and say something dangerous and scary about yourself and then lead that into like a question that's very hard and direct into a friend. And I don't mean hard and direct in a mean way. I mean in a vulnerable way, something that you are scared to ask because you're afraid that they will um, spur you and that it will hurt, right? These are the moments when you can be really stretching yourself in terms of in terms of mindfulness where you have to center yourself first to even do it in the first place. So I would say, think of the way that you're training mindfulness with your friends as a way of constantly stretching yourself, kind of like the Starbucks experiment that you have to do in the Mac program where you have to like go to Starbucks and put yourself in an emotional situation in order to observe and learn. You're doing the same thing with your friends and you're trying to constantly uh, be vulnerable with them and to, and to lead them in ways that would scare you relationally in terms of like how vulnerable you are or how much you put yourself out there, but in ways that connect you with them. In, in the long run, or help them or help you. Then as far as in-game, when there's chatter and there's talking and there's communication, you gotta be mindful. It's all about the present, right? So you just wanna make sure that you're hearing your teammates. That is the biggest thing. The number one flaw in breakdown in communication and strategy with all of the teams that I've ever coached has been hearing what their teammates said because their mind was dwelling on the past or planning something for the future. And so you gotta be really good at like listening and then also laning. Uh, and also executing. And obviously during a team fight or a skirmish, we're going to be reducing communication. Uh, and I don't have any expectations that people are listening to strategy or complex ideas or anything because besides target selection, direction, and timing. But but like you should be able to essentially uh, get really good at, at like opening your ears and hearing stuff and then processing it like parallel if you can with what you're doing in the lane. And that's the main mindfulness goal for in-game mindfulness with with uh, with the team is listening, communication, saying. So making yourself talk even when you don't want to, those kinds of things. So yeah, those, those are your training goals. Hope that was helpful and thanks for the great question. Let's jump into question number two. This time I'll put my headsets on first. Hello, well done. Uh, thanks to your Mac program, I changed my competitive passion. I was a League of Legends player and now I am a badminton player and I'm starting to become the best badminton player that I can be. But actually I got, actually I got the same um, mindset issue in League of Legends and in badminton. When uh, I am winning uh, the game uh, just at the end, I just throw and give the match to my opponent. And when I, when I do a huge comeback, um, just before winning, I throw it and I give the match. And people told me that I'm afraid to win, but I really want to win and I don't know what why I'm doing that. So can you help me to find the best way to, to close my game and what I need to think to be able to do that. Thanks. All right. Leo, thank you so much for calling in with this question. This sounds like a, like a really fun problem. Like I wish that I wish that I lived nearby you and we could work on this on the badminton court together because you have this problem in League of Legends and you have this problem in badminton and you have it when you are winning and you have it when you're coming back. So... And, and you're not afraid to win, like what they say, right? You're not afraid to win. That's that's kind of a silly situation. Who's afraid to win? Um, so what... Let me think about this. You're playing along in League of Legends, and it has to be related to the performance pressure and the expectations. 
it has to be related to expectations and performance pressure. So, so um, here's what I recommend, Leo. I think that you are emotionally avoidant, meaning that you are avoiding the emotions of expectations and pressure that you put on yourself at the end of the game. You are avoiding them at the beginning of the game. You are, and let me explain why I think this is a this is a fine thing. Okay, you are a very well adapted human. Humans are trained by the world to be very good at avoiding tough and and difficult emotions and tough and difficult emotional states and coping with them usually by making sure that they don't come up and that's a fine thing whatever like normally normal people can go through their normal lives and have normal whatever and like avoid emotions all they want and it's all good and dandy you cannot do that in traditional sport one of the first things that i had to work on with rookies generally is that their mechanisms that they learn from their families and their schools and their friends and their parents for avoiding uh, disruptive and dangerous emotion and rugged emotional states are useless in sport because you have to be able to confront those states head on and cope with them in order to have high performance. It's impossible to uh, like it's impossible to avoid them at the top at the at the end of the season at the end of the game at the end of the match at the end of the playoffs right you're going to find yourself in these high stakes situations and you cannot avoid them so what happens when you're really good at emotional avoidance is that you don't get to train your coping mechanisms very well you just train your not having experienced it mechanisms uh, instead of experiencing it over and over so usually what i do is i help the player up the pressure earlier on i help them notice what they're doing to avoid emotions which are usually very healthy behaviors okay these are bad things um and then i help them stop doing that and actually increase their anxiety and stress and performance mindset and the and the stringency that they place upon themselves for performance earlier on when it doesn't matter and then they can train the same coping mechanisms that they need later when high stakes game defining clutch moments come up so what I would recommend for you is find a way to make the beginning of the matches as stressful and high stakes for you as the end. Mentally, that means being like, okay, this point means everything. If I win this point, I win the match. If I lose this point, it's over. Like you can do that for yourself, right? You can put yourself on stage. You can play in front of people where it really matters um, and tell yourself that these these points matter at the beginning. That it's not about the end score and it's not about getting points. That it's like it's like how you look and how you play really matter, and you want to clutch it out no matter what in the beginning of the game, and try to treat those points as equally as important and as equally as high stakes and terrifying and scary. And if you mess up, it's over as the end. Um, and you can find there's there's a bajillion ways that I work with players to kind of like trick their brain into getting high stakes. But the main thing is that usually what we do is we look at what the emotional avoidance self-talk is. So what do you say to yourself when you mess up that first few points? Where are you in your mentality dealing with and coping with? Um, like, like, and what are you telling yourself earlier in the match to say fluid? Are you saying things like, all right, like, we got this, you know, we're in a groove, like, um, just play relax, like, this point doesn't matter, shake it off. Don't shake it off. This point does matter. Um, you're not in a groove. This is the this is the last point of the match, and, and everything relies on it. Um, uh, yeah, so, like, you kind of, like, reverse, pay attention to what you're doing and what you're saying to yourself and kind of reverse it and see if you can stress yourself out to the point where you choke in the first point of the match instead of at the end of the match and if you can do that you've made it you are done you have given yourself the opportunity to train your choking all the time and then you you start to power through it right then you start to like cope you start to learn how in this high stakes moment to focus and clutch the point anyway so I want you to inc basically increase the amount of times that you're in the throwing situation to the point where like you're training it more and you're going to learn to cope with it. And then you're and then you'll be done. Like your brain will will figure out how it is that you uh, handle these high stakes moments and you'll you'll start to get through it. There's like things that you can do rationalization um but most of it has to do with focus and telling yourself, I'm going to clutch it, I'm going to clutch it, and then experiencing that clutching it over and over again uh, until you can trust yourself. So 
yeah, hope that was helpful. And you're right. I do experience that a lot with my players, uh, especially rookies. And the answer is usually that uh, got to increase the amount of ruggedness in the everyday training that isn't an end of game, high stakes, throwable moment. Make every moment a throw moment. And then your brain quickly learns how to deal with the, with the anxiety. Not the anxiety, with the high stakes. Okay, let's jump into the last question. Before we do, I'm going to promote the MAC program. The first two questions mention this, and we, we go through it. But the MAC program is my training program, Mindfulness Acceptance Commitment Training Program, mindgames.gg slash MAC. Check it out at the URL. Use the code AskWeldon. It's an online video training course, 47 videos, seven modules, seven days each. Um, each module is a video. It contains a mindfulness training session so like a seated meditation and a lecture kind of like a mini ted talk over some slides you don't get to see my face just the slides uh and and i explain how to do high performance and mental resilience in any craft any performance based craft obviously some of the language is geared toward esport because this is an esport brand but this will apply to you if you're doing esport or like for example leo did the mac program made him stop playing Right, so a lot of people uh, do the Mac program and and discover they're doing escapism in a defective way in gaming, and they decide to throw themselves into their life instead, and they start performing there as a as a student, as a boyfriend or girlfriend, as a parent, as a manager. I've had a gentleman from Australia who was a manager who, um, you know, talked about how that he coped with this as a driver. People have talked about using it in their driving as well. So, however, it applies to your life. Uh, in terms of high performance, what it is that you want to personally optimize, this is the tool that I bake for you. Okay, last question. Hey, Weldon. I wanted to ask you about how much you think it's possible to change one's personality. If there are aspects of your personality that you don't like, can you do work to change them? Or would it be a much better investment of time and energy just learning to accept yourself for who you are? Just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, let's say you're a very serious, contemplative person, but you wish you were an extremely playful and humorous person. Or let's say you're a very cautious and calculating person, but you wish you were extremely adventurous and free-spirited. Obviously, I think anyone can learn to develop a little bit of whatever traits they desire, but do you think there are strict limitations in place based on our genes and how we were raised? Thanks. All right, so I really enjoy personality changing research. And, oh, let me change the camera shot. Here we go. And so I was like, okay, well, what's the update on this? Because a couple of years ago, there were studies about uh, the rate of personality change that found that it's much faster than we perceive, something like three years. And I recently discovered this study published last year, December. And I'll share it here uh, if I can show my browser. Yes, I can. Let me make this bigger. Um, scroll up. No, scroll. I'll just I'll just show the, the study itself. All right. So a coordinated analysis of big five trait change across 14 longitudinal studies. It has not been peer reviewed. All right. Well, that's not great. Uh, I thought this was published in a journal. Preprints. Oh, uh, okay. Well, let's wait till this is published and peer reviewed, you guys, before we cite it. But um, let's see citations. Uh, okay, there's a lot. But anyway, this is uh, what I what I am going to use this study for is finding the links to all the other 14 studies that they did and reading those. Uh, this one essentially took the big five personality traits and assessed and assessed them longitude and, and assessed them as a uh, review as a meta analysis. So that basically looks at other studies in an in an um, epidemiological way. So if you're familiar with with uh, epidemiological studies in medicine, then this is a very similar thing in psychology where essentially, oh, I'm covering my whole face. Jeepers. Go away. So you can see me and my awesome hat. There we go. Uh, basically, like you increase the sample size by, by taking in really useful studies that are all the same and then assessing stuff. So, and what they found was basically that... Uh, neuroticism, extroversion, conscientiousness, and openness go down over time and agreeableness remains stable. So, and that, and that the rate happens uh, over the course of three to 10 years 
uh, intervals, but mostly quicker than what people perceive it to happen. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm now interested in this and in, in looking into reading the studies that were actually done. So this is not an experimental study. This is a meta-analysis. And I, I recommend meta-analyses for getting a grasp of the field, but I recommend reading the actual experimental research in order to discover quality uh, so that you understand like the reality of the research and what the limitations are going to be and, and what real assumptions you can draw from it. So my answer to your question is, I don't know, but I assume that you can change these things about yourself uh, and and that there are strong genetic barriers in place. So I don't think that there are genetic limits. I, I really do not think that there are genetic limits. But because like that's absurd. Just the idea that you would be genetically limited in your personality is, is kind of insane. Just to even think about how that would occur. Like I'm not even sure that that's possible for the brain to do to you. But there are certainly genetic barriers, right? Where you, you come out with a personality. We know that. Uh, and this personality changes throughout your life. We know that. Um, and it changes both in terms of the environment affecting you and in terms of like aging. So we know that there that there are certain things that just happen as you age, like you just get more conservative. Um, you just get less liable, like less used to change and things like that. This happens when your brain matures when you hit, you know, mid 20s, first of all, and then it happens again, like just as you age. Um, and so we know, we know these things are going to, to kind of like, you know, happen, but then there is the intentional change and the environmental change, and and certainly people's personalities are shifted by traumatic events, et cetera, et cetera. So, if you have a conscient, a, a concentrated kind of like effort to change in a certain specific way, then dependent on the resistance that you have from your like base personality, probably there'll be a, you know, it'll be harder or easier. Uh, but no, there's no limit. I would say to what you can do. I would, and this is from personal assumption that I that I can't think of a way that the brain could limit who you could become aside from uh, aside from like if we're talking neurotypical people okay so if we're talking a neurotypical like obviously there's probably a limit to what a schizophrenic person can do without medication all right but uh, but if we're talking neurotypical then then I think that that what you're looking at is more like how hard is it to do for you in particular it's kind of like think of it this way you're learning a language, right? Let's say you're learning Chinese and you speak English. Um, that's hard. Let's say you're learning Chinese and you speak Cantonese. Or you're learning Mandarin and you speak Cantonese. Oh, that's a little bit easier. Let's say you're learning Korean and you speak Japanese. Easy. Let's say you're learning Japanese and you speak English. Harder. Okay? So, let's say you're learning Russian and you speak English. It's like climbing Everest. Let's say you're trying to learn Russian and you speak, I don't know, like Slovak or some Slovakian language. Uh, maybe it's paltry, right? Um, let's say you're learning Finnish and you speak English. That's not a neighbor language. They're not even in the same language family. One is Finno-Ugric and one is uh, like related to Persian. Uh, is is in the um, oh, come on, come on, come on. What's Indo-European language family? So yeah, you're gonna have a hard time. But if you're Hungarian or Estonian, you're gonna learn Finnish very easily. So it's like it's kind of like language families, I would say. Like some personalities probably adapt better into other ones. Some, it's going to be a very hard thing for you to do and, and you, it'll probably be a long time before you feel comfortable in your skin and maybe you never will, but you will act that way anyway. Like you'll learn the behaviors, but it will it will always be a challenge for you to step up into it, okay? I would say make yourself into the person that you want to be. Don't place preconceived barriers on yourself or preconceived limits on yourself based on what you think about what is possible, especially related to personality. There's enough of that that is not possible in the real world. Like there's enough of things that you can't do like in 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 the traditional world of, of actual achievement related to business or, well, not business because business is an open system. But if we're talking about closed systems, like, you know, where there can only be 10 basketball players, so they're going to pick the best ones, period. Um, there's enough things that you like cannot accomplish there to then limit yourself in terms of personality change, which seems like something that is very fun and developmental and possible to do as a as a hobby and as an as an intention throughout your life. So I would say design the person that you want to be and then figure out how to be that person and aim for that and aspire for that and discover this answer for yourself by failing over the course of 50 years, but at least 
try. That's the show for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Make sure to check out the show live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash mindgameswell, and come on over there right now. Uh, call in your questions, anchor.fm slash Green. Call in your questions, call in your questions, call in your questions. This show runs on your oxygen and fuel from calling in your questions, so please do that. Uh, my memes are on Twitter. You know where to find me there. My name's Weldon, and um, check out the Mac program because that's the only way that I support this brand is the Mac program. That's it. And it's a really, 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 really freaking good deal. I swear to you on my life that this is an insane deal. It is, I, I promise. 25 bucks for this content, it's amazing. It's amazing. And you get it forever, right? Even if I upgrade it, no matter what. Like, I'm going to keep upgrading it. It's going to keep getting better and better. And I'm going to keep doing more content. I'm doing version four right now. I was literally working on it yesterday. And it's going to, and, and like, you get grandfathered into every single future version of it. The people who bought it, like, a while ago, like, they're getting the updated version too. So it, you just keep getting more and more stuff for free as as it goes on. It's like one of those original iPhone apps you pay $1.99 for, and it, it, like, becomes an amazing app five years down the road, and you still have it. That's what this is, at least right now. So check it out. And um, uh, I appreciate you and your attention. See you guys tomorrow.